we'll chat later on um, after, after eight o'clock. I'll call you. Okay, that's fine. Okay. That's fine, yeah. That's... Okay, Kamu, I think we maybe we can start letting people in and then we see what goes on. You can switch off your video, Prof, once, uh, once you're settled. Okay. And then we will, after, I'll switch off mine too, and then we will let the people in and I'll, we'll take. For over 20 years, Clinics Health Group has provided world-class healthcare to underserviced communities. With every new facility we open, quality, affordability and excellence is what we've become synonymous with. To that end, Cullinan Wellness Hospital is the latest addition to the group and the third in our growing roster of psychiatric care services. Located in Cullinan, east of Pretoria, our state-of-the-art facility is perfectly suited to service patients as far as Mpumalanga, Limpopo and the Northwest Province in a tranquil setting surrounded by a luscious garden and mountain views. It's very important for us to have such facilities in our communities because um, previously we, we've ignored the, the, the psychological instability. We, we thought we can go on with stress or depression and because now that we have come out as 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 a psychiatric faculty to say we can offer this kind of of care treatment and rehabilitation for people who are in need of who need to to heal emotionally or psychologically so these kind of facilities are important to be i would wish that Every area would have this kind of wellness facilities. I think mental health institutions um, and wellness centers such as this one are important mainly because we, we, we live a very rat race type of life and struggle to see when we are truly struggling with life. And being able to come into a facility like this allows one to pause, pause and acknowledge whatever is happening in your life that is bringing you down, um, pause and regain function, pause and, and, and get back onto your feet in a way that you didn't even realize you needed. Um, th there's the need to have an out of your comfort zone area that will move and shake you as much as possible to get you back into um, a better state of you. No matter the treatment or duration of stay at Cullinan Wellness Hospital, our patients and their loved ones can rest assured that they will be taken care of and watched over by our team of experienced mental health nurses, psychiatrists and clinical psychologists. 
Most of the patients that we admit are voluntary patients and they come on their own. The diagnosis that we normally work around is that patients has um, a patients with um, bipolar mood disorder, major depressive disorders, as well as um, post-traumatic stress disorders. Some has personality disorders such as gambling. Our hospital provides private psychiatric services that aim to help the individual experience the fullness of life. We cater for a wide range of patients, including those with depression, bipolar, post-traumatic stress disorders, anxiety disorders, sleeping difficulties, neurocognitive disorders, dementia, and psychiatric conditions, amongst others. My approach is I use what we call cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. So basically it's uh, helping because most of the time I've noticed that we tend to be depressed or um, go into mental problems because of the channeling of our thoughts. Um, we tend to think if you are going through a, a difficult situation, you tend to think more negative about it than um, thinking positive about it and actually getting a solution. So I just help my patients to come up with solutions and um, hence I use solution focused therapy because I'm confident that they do have solutions. It's just that sometimes they're not confident to put them into action. My approach when treating a patient um, goes back to the good old Batu Pele principles. Um, we, we follow a very client-centered approach. Uh, every case is different and so applying Batu Pele principles where it's about the patient, it's about dignity, it's about ensuring that the patient's needs are met um, is at the core of, of practice, is at the core of all intervention. As mental health practitioners, we encourage individuals to visit our facility so we can assist them in finding routine solutions to the problems they face on a day-to-day -day basis. I think from a, from a very simple point of a non-functional mind as an unfunctional human, um, and neglecting mental health means, in essence, neglecting a whole part of yourself that is very necessary to maintain function on a day-to-day. Um, the more we, we ignore the brain and the psychology and the emotions of, 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 a, of a person as we have been, the more we are likely to, 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 not, to not reach to the full potential that we could. At Clinics Cullinan Wellness Hospital, we believe mental health is the cornerstone to helping you find and lead a happy, balanced life. Visit our magnificent facility at Hospital Road, Cullinan, Pretoria East. We're open seven days a week and are ready to receive you. Good evening indeed. Uh, we, we pray that you will visit our hospital, Kalinan, East of Pretoria. And um, welcome once more, colleagues, uh, to this webinar. And it's great to have you all back once more. Uh, there are those of you who've been with us since uh, 2020. We appreciate your support. And we trust that uh, over the last two and a half years or so, you've gained a lot of uh, medical knowledge from esteemed colleagues, uh, top clinicians that we're bringing in, and also others who are very, in the early stages of their careers, uh, we have tried to have a, a balanced combination of of, of such speakers that we have. And uh, so this evening we're continuing with our mental health series, uh, the, the last of it uh, tonight, as we host uh, Professor Solomon uh, Radaimai. Uh, as usual, this is a CPD accredited uh, webinar, and we hope that when you registered, you provided all your details about uh, yourself and your contact details, and also your registration number, whether we are with the HPCSA, the Nursing Council or Pharmacy Council or the Allied Health Professions uh, Council. And um, so that we, we then some, uh, provide you with the CPD points at the end of this, uh, the, the webinar, especially for those who are registered to the HPSCS because you don't have to do anything. Just give us the details, we process it, and your certificate, the points will be uploaded. And also note that this is a, a 
this 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 program is streamed live on YouTube. So if you want to have a look at the presentation the following day, we can do so at your own time. Uh, just go to YouTube and uh, like at Linux webinars so that you can always get a reminder about forthcoming webinars, but also be able to view uh, previous uh, presentations. And uh, we request that also as we start the webinar that you mute your mics and you switch off your videos uh, just to enhance the quality of uh, the feeding that we'll be having uh, during the presentation. And so this evening, we are excited to have uh, Professor Soli uh, in our midst, uh, who is the former head of the Department of Psychiatry uh, at two universities, the first from the University of the First State uh, from 1998 to 2003, and then also the uh, then Medusa, or now there's Fokumakato Health Sciences University from 2003 until 2019. He is the Africa Regional Representative of World Association for Psychosocial Rehabilitation and is a specific interest in addiction, psychiatry, and child and adolescent psychiatry. And Professor Soli Redaman is also the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Mental Health. He is the current chairperson of the Medical and Dental Board of the Health Professions Council, HPCSA. And he was a deputy chairperson of the Central Drug Authority of South Africa from 1995 to 2000 and became chairperson from 2000 to 2005. He has also represented South Africa and African Union activities related to substance abuse. And this included meetings of the International Narcotics Control Board in Vienna. Um, he has participated in various activities on substance abuse, and he contributes to teach and provide support in this area. He is a past member of the Health Committee of the HPCSC, hence his, his uh, participation this evening on um, uh, the topic that we've chosen. Uh, that he, in that committee was providing support to health practitioners affected by abuse of such substances, substances such as alcohol and drugs, and other issues that may lead to impairment. He holds an MBSHB from the of Natal, or Cosmo Natal now, also in the field of the, uh, from the psychiatry from the Colleges of Medicine of South Africa, and also has a qualification in child and adolescent psychiatry from the UK. And so this evening, he is talking about a topical subject. We've seen what has happened in the past few months. And so uh, the, the topic is about underage drinking, a look into recent tavern deaths. Uh, so, Prof. Ratamani, it's a pleasure to welcome you back at this uh, webinar. And you know that you're one of the participants on a regular basis. And tonight we are glad that you've accepted the invitation to be a speaker as you've done before. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bila. Um, let me just open by saying that whilst we want to look at the recent deaths at the taverns, I wanted us to focus mainly on underage drinking. We don't really have clear data as to how many teenagers were at these taverns, how many drinkers at these taverns were underage. I think what uh, has brought up the issue of underage drinking is the death of the kids in the Eastern Cape Tavern, Enyobene Tavern, which we'll come back to later. But these tavern shootings have been uh, problematic in that they appear to be at random. Uh, they were generally supported. These taverns were supported by all age groups. What is interesting is that uh, the owners of the taverns didn't really ask younger people to show their IDs or not step in or drink at the particular tavern. So there was no monitoring of who comes in to buy or to drink. It seems as though for the tavern owners, the main thing was to basically make money. There are numerous stakeholders who should be taking interest in this area of uh, underage drinking and actually what happens in the taverns, where are they located, what is their proximity to schools, uh, to homes, to churches, and so on. And some of the stakeholders would include the liquor board, South African Police Services, Department of Health, Department of Social Development, Ministry of Trade and Industry, in specifically for regulations about location of taverns and hours of operation. And I think most important 
in looking at what happens to these taverns because they're in our communities. You may find that there are two, three taverns in one street or two streets would have eight taverns and the kids are there until very late at night or into the early hours of the morning. What is of concern to me is what is the local community saying? Uh, is there no interest or is there fear of reporting the fact that there are children who go to these places? Um, in line with this, there is concern from government circles and uh, there is a proposed new law for South Africa, the Liquor Amendment Bill, which has been there uh, since 2018. Uh, it's going to be tabled in parliament again and, uh, to, and it's going to be introduced for review, particularly to address health, education and behavioral issues. Because it seems as though with regard to addictions, which is chronic relapsing condition, you really have to be in touch with yourself, with your family, with your children, and be able to communicate positively with them. Um, the bill, when it's tabled, we'll be looking at restricting advertising of alcohol on public platforms. We can discuss this at the later stage. It also wants to look at the enforcing, increasing the legal drinking age from 18 to 21. Question is whether if you start drinking at 21, uh, will that reduce the rate of drinking or underage drinking? And will we succeed in doing so? Thirdly, to be looking at the regulating specific trading days and hours for alcohol to be distributed and manufactured. Now, when you go to countries like Norway, there are these big cooperatives. You know that it's open on certain days, certain hours, and you can buy and go and use the alcohol at home. Maybe this is the direction that people want to go. Uh, it also wants to look at placing liability of alcohol on alcohol retailers and manufacturers for harm related to the contravention of regulations. And this is an important point because um, more and more we hear of so-called responsible alcohol use and the associations that promote that. And uh, these associations would also like to provide uh, financial support to organizations that are helping people with um, addiction problems. There's a big debate now about the tobacco companies, alcohol companies, do organizations, ordinary organizations take money from them? We can discuss that at the later stage. Um, it also wants to look at banning of alcohol advertising on radio and television and on billboards less than 100 meters away from junctions, street corners and traffic circles. I, I know when you drive, you come to a corner, you really should be concentrating on turning carefully or the traffic circle, and then there's beautiful billboard there that says this type of drink is cool. Uh, that can be a problem. Now, if you move forward, we have to look at why kids and teenagers drink. Adolescence is generally a time of great upheaval, driven by physical and hormonal changes. We've all gone through this phase. You feel strong, bold, you want to take risks, and you want to do everything possible that will make you look like you're very mature, you're older, and you can take care of yourself. The other reason is that uh, as a teenager, you're curious, but you're not curious in a vacuum. You're curious uh, in a situation of family in the context of community. So one of the things that uh, we don't seem to look at is the family dynamics. Many, many children who drink early and drink heavily are doing this as an act of rebellion and defiance. They defy their parents. They, they rebel against the rules set by the family, by the schools and society for them, particularly if uh, there are other problematic issues within the family, particularly between the parents. The next is peer pressure. This is most commonly blamed that you feel left out if you're not part of a group. And so to be part of that group, if they are drinking, you want to join and that joining might lead to excessive drinking, particularly have underlying associated problems. We then have environment, environmental influences. Films and TV sometimes make um, drinking look cool, something cool to do. It distorts you know, the, social, you know, the social environment. It, so, it, it makes people feel like uh, they're doing very well. I think many of you who watch television and soapies and so on, uh, including Big Brother Nigeria, Big Brother um, Zanzim, you'll notice that um, there's a 
programs are supported strongly by the liquor industry. And there were adverts that were run there. A particular whiskey was being uh, promoted and it made you feel like it's cool to use that whiskey. And one advert actually showed highly educated black children, black teenagers who have just finished high, you know, uh, their degrees and so on, drinking this whiskey. And, and, and this is the influence of uh, social media. So the young teenager who is really uninitiated, who's not well supported at home, might think this is the way to go, to have a degree or to do well in society, you must drink and drink a lot. The other point is to cope with underlying problems. Many teenagers are bored and boredom can lead to all sorts of problems. Some have underlying anxiety, depression, and many have low self-esteem. There may be teenagers with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So all these people may be using alcohol and other drugs as a form of self-medication. And now these, these issues um, imply that parents must be open-minded. They must not be in denial. You don't have to think that your child, because you are a particular type of family, will not do these things. If people say, look, check your child, he seems to be over drinking, take that seriously. Talk to your child, your teenager, and so on. And it's both young men and young women. The next point is to appear older and independent. You prove that uh, they want to prove that they're no longer kids and they're and they also mimic their parents. Now, this mimicking of parents is a very important issue. In most cases, when you take a history in, uh, from a young child or a teenager who has been drinking too much and perhaps using other drugs, when you go back into the family, you find that there is often a history of heavy drinking or there's someone else that they admired who drank heavily and they thought that was a way to go. Finally, there is lack of parental boundaries. Uh, the teenagers usually test the limits. And if parents don't set the boundaries, uh, they're likely to overuse alcohol. So what I mean here is that uh, it seems as though there's a lot of responsibility uh, based on um, parental involvement. And the issue of when to drink, at what age, what's a reasonable age, is a problem well over. For instance, the age of initiation of alcohol in the USA uh, vary, uh, because this is varying from one country to country. You know, you may vote at the age of 18 and you drink at 21. So 18 makes you an adult enough to vote. But, but why can't you drink at the same time also? Uh, uh, the, you know, you visit the local casino at 21, you rent a car at 25, and you can run for president at 35. This age uh, boundaries at times, at, at times problematic, but they have to be looked at in terms of our, our own society and other societies. But um, there has been an effort the world over to stick to the age of 21. Um, so though these ages may appear arbitrary, they, they take into account the requirements, risks and benefits of each act. The national minimum link drinking age of 21 has survived the test of time and is firmly supported by current scientific research. The lives and futures of our children depend on is continued support. The point here is how do we implement this and how do we make sure that uh, the retailers, uh, the tavern owners, or any other outlet that sells uh, these drinks uh, recognizes the need to actually check the IDs of those who come in and buy. This is a problem. So in the US, the top five reasons to keep uh, minimal uh, limit of drinking age at 21 would include the fact that 21 saves lives. You know, um, people are mature. The brain does not fully develop until at least 21. You get a key to go into the world, outside the world, explore everything, including getting married and so on uh, at 21. Although people have had sex before 21, they've been drinking before 21. Most families will give you the key at the age of 21. But the, Research points to the fact that the longer we can delay alcohol use, the better the chance that the person will never have a problem with alcohol. They may drink socially, and this happens particularly in families where parents do drink socially. Uh, you never see them drunk, but they do always have their glass of wine or this uh, daily or every other day or whenever they have meals outside the family. So there are policies that seem to work, but the implementation of these policies is a problem. 
So in the U.S., the Department of Defense uh, regulations allows members of the active military who are under 21 to consume alcohol, but they have to be over 18. But in control situations, now, do we have those control situations for our young people in this country? Uh, these are some of the questions I want you to think about and come back uh, to discuss them. So the evidence for 21 is really ample and um, it, this has resulted in reduction of alcohol-related crashes and uh, fatalities among youth, as well as deaths from suicide, homicide, and non-vehicle unintentional injuries. For many people who shoot themselves, who uh, kill others, homicidal deaths, and so on, you find that uh, there was heavy use of alcohol and maybe other drugs before the incident happened. And, and this is a problematic issue. Um, and, and, and you may find that this person has dealt, has battled with alcohol use in earlier years. The prefrontal brain, uh, uh, part of the brain that's very, very important, the area that controls judgment and, and weighing risk and consequences, tends to develop at 21 and after. It is poorly developed earlier, and it's confirmed by recent studies to be about properly developed at age 25 and not 18 as stated before. Below 25, there is more thrill seeking and impulsive behavior. The hormonal drive is very high. Also impair, it can impair use of alcohol at an age less than 21, impairs judgment and heightens risk-taking behavior. And there's a possibility of long-term irre uh, irreversible damage. I mean, these are the times when people want to buy motorbikes and they drive fast and so on. So addiction tends to set in early teenagers, six to 18, 18 months after they started to drink. But uh, it tends to start later in adults, you know, plus minus five years after they started to drink. Although many adults would become addicts one or two years after they started drinking. But what is clear is that delaying underage drinking for as long as possible and reducing its frequent use and quantity of use reduces any onset of harmful effects such as suicide, homicide, accidents, and so on. There are parents who will testify that they thought their kids were doing well, but they were not aware that the kids or the child was drinking heavily, and they didn't know when that problem started. So in 1978, uh, the US National Study of on Adults and Drinking noted that many 10th and 12th graders um, were often drunk. They drank significantly more and were less likely to abstain from alcohol at the later stage. So they tended to want to keep to this uh, minimum age uh, of drinking at 21. And, and they found that those kids who were able to, to control themselves below the age of 21 and start drinking more socially and more often after the age of 21, did a little better and they were able to manage other areas of their lives not just uh, the drinking. So 18 year old uh, who would serve in the military uh, would drink in control situations, but uh, the strictness of the military in the US was also that uh, they can only drink after, at and after the age of 21. Now, when you go to the incident in the Eastern Cape, the Enya Tavern tragedy, this is really brought the highlight to the issue of underage drinking. And the president of the country was really concerned about this. And when he addressed the community um, in East London around the burial of these kids, his emphasis was, why are you not able to control underage drinking? Is there something that you can do as a society? Now, this incident happened on the 26th of June, 2022. 21 people died during celebrations at the Shebin in East London, Eastern Cape and uh, four more were injured. Legal drinking age, as you know, in this country is 18, but alcohol was served to minors. The event was promoted on Facebook and um, people had written there that because of fever, there is going to be death, but they didn't know that uh, in fact, there was indeed going to be death. This was a pens down celebration after exams. And um, it, the reports say the bouncers were unable to stop people from coming in. So there are those who forced their way into the, into the place uh, through the gate and uh, they could not be kept out by the bouncers. Nine girls and 12 boys between the ages of 13 and 17 died. Now this is a tragedy, a serious tragedy for the country. On the 19th of July, 
toxicology revealed presence of methanol in all bodies of the deceased, uh, putting to rest the speculation of carbon monoxide and alcohol poisoning. I think this is an important issue because methanol is a very toxic, high concentrate alcohol that is used in industry and in chemicals for cleaning heart services, met metallic services, and so on. It is not supposed to be found in the drinks. So we don't know whether this kids brought it in or it was there or something else happened. Uh, I've looked at the reports recently. The parents are still not happy even with uh, the fact that methanol is supposed to be the only thing that contributed to the deaths. And I cannot go into this forensic issue because the investigations are still ongoing and people in the Eastern Cape will know more about this. But that was a very tragic thing that made us think of uh, the real reasons to, to look at what's actually happening in society. So the basis for this course is the following. Does early drinking cause problems? Is it related to adolescents only? Is age 18 not enough? You know, what will happen if you push the minimum age of drinking to 21? Will that solve the problem? How well are we implementing and monitoring current legislation? Are our resources coordinated? Who are the stakeholders? A civil society, Department of Trade and Industry, SEPs, Correctional Services, Department of Justice, Education, Health and Social Development. So transport, every ministry basically is involved in a multi-ministerial problem. The liquor industry, liquor board is very much involved in this because uh, they also want to see a business going on. But the partnerships between the liquor board and the other stakeholders has become strongly after this incident in the Eastern Cape. And I must just uh, point out, uh, you can see that these slides were also presented uh, at the meeting with the, that was coordinated by Foundation for uh, Professional Development to educate us more about uh, uh, underage drinking. Alcohol consumption in many developing countries um, it's a problem and levels of consumption have increased in recent years. Change in drinking patterns from traditional use of home brews with low alcohol content to more frequent recreational use of uh, commercial alcoholic beverages has increased. Now, this is really a real problem because um, in all our celebrations, you know, weddings, even including uh, funerals, you know, christening of children, every celebration we have, um, any moment of uh, jubilation getting together, there is some form of alcohol. How do you then control this? How do you then say to children, please don't start now. Your age will come for starting to drink. These are questions that I would like to hear from you, how you, you're going to talk to children. So the key concerns and trends are the following. We are worried about underage drinking, but not only just underage drinking, but binge drinking. Many of the young teenage, uh, kids or teenagers who end up in severe accidents or young adults who end up in severe accidents had been out drinking, but they didn't just drink socially. They drank too many drinks at a given time. So this led to motor car accidents leading to cause of death, high number of severe injuries to the head and body, and with blood alcohol levels of uh, 0.08 or higher. And there's also an increase in dropout rate uh, President Ramaphosa noted that uh, recently, when they looked at the number of people, young people who go and queue up for the grant, social grant, the, the 350, I don't know that's increased now. These are people who dropped out of school, who didn't finish matric. And we still don't have answers as to why not. Why did they not complete? Why were they not supported to complete? There's increase in sexually transmitted uh, diseases, HIV, AIDS, and others, increase in social violence, particularly gender-based violence. And of course, there is increase in many areas of fetal alcohol syndrome, particularly in those areas where people were paid with alcohol instead of giving money or food. And then of course, there's alcohol and other infectious diseases. Now, there is an ever-increasing use of these substances. So the overview of effects of underage drinking, and I'm repeating these things for reinforcement purposes, would be the following. More young people die from illegal drinking than use of illegal drugs. Drinking and driving leads to most deaths and mobility among youth. 
And this effect, it's important when you buy your teenager a car to say, you know, if you're going to drive, don't touch alcohol. If you're going to touch alcohol, have a friend who's not drinking or Uber home or get a taxi or something, but don't drive because you are not aware of the degree to which alcohol has uh, impaired their motor responses. Suicide due to depression and stress is the third leading cause of death in the age range 14 to 25. And uh, many of the young people who commit suicide have also been using alcohol a lot. Sexual assault, rape, which is high, most females are raped, high risk sex, multiple partners, a failure to use condoms, unwanted pregnancies, sexual transmitted diseases, all these are linked to a cons con consuming of uh, high amounts of alcohol and you lose your controls, you lose your inhibitions. And of course, the common trend is poor academic achievement. The day after you don't want to go to school, you don't want to do your homework. Um, it, there's increase in social violence, not just gender-based violence, general social violence. So there's always potential to develop alcohol dependence in the future. So these people who may be involved in these accidents may not currently be having alcohol dependence, but they do binge drink. And it's in those periods that uh, they're binge drinking that uh, they may end up uh, abusing other people, getting involved in accidents, and they may themselves die. Um, so there are some polemical dynamics of this uh, problem. Alcohol has been part of society for years. It is easily available, embedded in culture of, cele of celebrations of all sorts. It's very nice, but you cannot say so loudly. Major contributor to national revenue for many countries. This is a difficult you know, uh, issue for many countries who are dependent on the revenue from taxation of alcohol drinks, tobacco uh, products, and so on. Uh, if you want to touch alcohol, it goes to parliament, cabinet so many times, but you never really know exactly. For instance, the bill I was talking about earlier on has been there since 2018, but it was not touched in parliament because uh, it would mean limiting access to taxation on alcoholic uh, drinks. Uh, most countries have regulations in place for sales, sales points, age restrictions, and hours of business. Enforcement is an issue. And this is exactly what has happened in the tavern in the Eastern Cape and in other taverns throughout the country. Questions abound about advertising. Many people say, you know, if you reduce or you stop advertising, People will still go and drink. They'll still find the alcohol. They'll still find tobacco. There is no real proof that um, restrictions would lead to less use. But advertising does improve sales. That is the fact. You know, but even without advertising, people still access. So what can be done then? I want to hear from you. There's also a route of taxation adopted for increasing you know, tax on these alcoholics, you know, the so-called sin tax. It's been going higher and higher, but people are drinking more and more, and there are more and more accidents, and there are more and more social problems. What are we really saying about taxation? Is it really fair, or should we be using other methods to control uh, the usage, the availability, access to alcohol and, 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 uh, and tobacco products, for instance? So the age of use has come much lower than 18 in many countries. But again, in those countries, there is a problem. So, so there's a tendency to, to be associated with smoking. You remember that during the peak of COVID, uh, government really claimed down on the sale of cigarettes and alcohol because there is a known scientific relationship between uh, having drinking and smoking. Many people who smoke, who, who drink a lot, tend to smoke and the other way around. Um, so, and this drinking leads to loss of inhibitions and there's reckless behavior. And we know from uh, studies done by Medical Research Council that um, there were many people before they climbed down during the COVID period who appeared in the emergency rooms because of all stuff injuries related to alcohol use. But um, during the climb down by government, which I really supported, is that um, there were fewer emergency admissions or, you know, appearances by people who were involved in accidents and so on because of alcohol. So dynamics of underlying personality types not fully explored. This is something that we need to look at. 
Is it everyone who can become an alcoholic because of early drinking? Um, or are there certain people who are prone to this? Um, Indrasia has sponsored major events in the world, including education and sports. Um, and, um, and, and people are happy about this and they will be happy to drink uh, this type of beer or that type of whiskey and so on. And, and, and they are successful, but um, those people who participate in those sporting activities uh, don't themselves become alcoholics. They don't drink too much, but they drink socially. So there is a love hate relationship with governments because uh, the benefit from the taxation of these products, uh, alcohol and tobacco, but the purists, the purists will still have problems with seem with the same to similar to those who partake of alcohol beverages. For instance, you say, look, I don't drink. Uh, you know, I, I drink a lot, but uh, I have the same problem, similar to those of people who don't drink. So, so what is the point of intervention? Where is the point of intervention? Is it really true, or is it simply uh, personalities that we have? Uh, this is not clear. So the effects of alcohol, just for repetition, intoxication, the impairs brain function and motor skills. People undermine this and say, no, I'll just have a glass or two. A glass or two may lead to a, glass, a three or four. And in no time, you don't realize that uh, you are less inhibited, your motor skills, your responses are reduced. Uh, it affects every organ of a uh, user's body and can harm the fetus. Heavy use linked to increase of certain cancers stroke and liver disease. If you take any a good history in many people with uh, uh, cancer of the lung, there is usually a history of drinking and smoking uh, in the majority. Of course, there are people who don't drink, don't smoke, but who may have these cancers, but there is a smaller percentage. Moderate use is associated with decreased cardiovascular problems and delayed onset of dementia. So, so it's like you can use, but not too much. You are safe, but the, are you able to keep safe all the time? What triggers you to heavy drinking? That is a problem. So alcoholism or dependence, strong craving for alcohol and not continue to use despite harm or personal injury. This is why we have a difficulty. But when you look at that statement, it tells you that uh, this person has underlying problems that he may be trying to avoid or that he's not being able to solve you know, successfully. So the abuse leads to alcoholism which is a pattern of drinking that results in harm to one's health, interpersonal relationships, or ability to work. Families break down. People who love each other, who got into a marriage, you know, loving each other very well, but because of alcohol, things just uh, fall apart. So there are all sorts of harms, like physical illness, frequent accidents, school dropout, absenteeism, and poor work performance. And of course, mental instability is pointed out. Um, there are a number of slides here, and many of them I'll just jump because um, they may not be helpful for this talk. But 15.1 million people abuse or, or dependent uh, on alcohol in the USA, and the number has increased now. These are the studies that by uh, NIAAA is a key body that does work in alcoholism. 4.6 million of whom are women. So there's a high number of women and men who abuse alcohol. Now, South Africa, Sakendu, in the Medical Research Council, you know, looked at the various you know, countries in the SADC region, and they found that alcohol is still number one substance of abuse, uh, followed by cannabis, and it accounts for most admissions for treatment throughout the region, complicated by use in combination with other substances. And I think that's an important point. I mean, I recently, had to chat with a family who believed that their child does not take any drugs. But uh, when we looked around, we found that a lot of things had disappeared. The child had been taking things to sell them and the parents were not aware of this. And when they started searching the house, they found that a lot of things had disappeared. The child had to sell them to go and buy alcohol and drugs. So we have a problem with the adolescent alcohol use the current use ranges between 1.5% between to 62% and binge drinking, which is most problematic, between 14% to 40%. And, and this is a problem at universities. I mean, students will fight to have uh, bars, you know, liquor stores within their campuses, but there is no control of how much they drink. And many, many surveys have found that uh, 
in the past month, many students will admit to uh, 17.1 to 58% of them will admit to heavy drinking. This is a study done in South Africa by Pelsa and others. Um, and binge drinking, just to put it in context, it's having five or more drinks in a row at one sitting in the past two weeks. And uh, whilst this is blind among some uh, students, it is increased, it's increasing and fluctuating as you go higher at, at high school. Um, most of the seniors who have problems with their academic work, with their school work, tend to drink a little more uh, in one sitting, that is binge drinking. And the patterns seem to be associated with availability of alcohol. And of course, access and money. As parents, we give children money and they keep coming to us for more. We never want to know what they did with the money. So the trends in binge drinking would include higher levels of drinking among noted among rural than urban women. I don't believe that statement. I think you may find that uh, it's the same. Uh, the province with largest male binge drinkers in this country used to be the Western Cape, followed by the Northern Cape, Houghton, Free State. But I think these figures were at a particular time. You may find that because people are now moving from province to province because of work availability. Uh, the binge drinkers might be evenly distributed in all these provinces. But the fact is, uh, in the Western Cape, people who worked in the wine farms and so on, um, where there was the highest incidence of fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, people are paid with alcohol and not money. And they would pay and they would drink a lot of it just to uh, keep well. And the, the next slide, we note that alcohol and road accidents, the, this has not changed. High proportion, about 46% 40, of mortality cases due to non-natural causes have had blood alcohol levels greater than or equal to 0.95 grams per 100 ml, which is the legal, the legal limit of, uh, for driving. In other countries, there's zero tolerance for alcohol. If you are tested and you have some alcohol, it is a problem. Now, this slide basically tells us that uh, in this study, um, where 31,000 fatally injured cases were recorded and the uh, blood alcohol levels were down, uh, the greatest slice there, which is blue, is those people who had multiple injuries. Uh, this was because they had higher level of alcohol concentration in the blood. Uh, we can skip the next slide because it just reemphasizes the fact that uh, um, alcohol testing must be done not only in the driver, but also in the pedestrians because, uh, uh, and also people within, for instance, the taxis, you find that one, an accident can happen because uh, there are, you know, passengers who are drinking a lot interfering with the driver's ability to drive carefully, but the driver may be intoxicated himself, the pedestrian may be. So it means that the, when you have an accident scene, don't focus on the driver only, also check the passengers, but also check the pedestrian or the people who have been injured. Um, let's keep the next slide. Alcohol and risky sexual behavior is a known factor. There are many studies and I won't go into details about this. Imaging data on the link between alcohol use and risky sexual behavior is of great concern and it's continuing to be so. We noticed that uh, during the lockdown here, despite the fact that there was a restriction on the sale of alcohol, people still found ways of getting alcohol and other drugs and uh, gender-based violence actually increased during the lockdown. So, so this is still a problem and it affecting younger and younger people. Now, fetal alcohol syndrome, I've talked about, uh, there's a team of researchers, uh, May and others who are from the USA, we worked with some of them. They looked at this area in the, in the, in, in the Western Cape where people worked in farms and um, they were paid with alcohol this is where they had the highest incidence of fetal alcohol syndrome, 18 to 145 times greater than for various populations in the USA. It was actually shocking for, it was much higher for, compared to other areas in South Africa. More than 40 cases per 1,000 children um, in the Western Cape and the Northern Cape um, had the fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, this is important to know that in some of these areas, there are no recreational facilities. If you go to the Northern Cape, some towns, early in the morning you see people who walk out, you realize that they want alcohol, 
they're hungry, uh, they have tremors and so, so on. And the only thing that they'll go to and find is alcohol. There are no jobs, no recreational facilities, they have, they have nowhere to go. More than 20 cases per 1,000 children in Houten province were found to have fetal alcohol syndrome. Figures represent some of the highest rates of fetal alcohol syndrome in the world. But I must emphasize that uh, this is regional. Now, there are a number of slides here, which I'll just summarize, uh, I think three or four of them. Um, this issue of age, what is the right age for starting to drink, has been a problem throughout the world. In African countries, in Europe, in the Americas, Australasia, and so on. For instance, if you look at Gabon, uh, you can purchase alcohol at age, at age 18. And of course, you won't just purchase and not drink. Uh, you go to Lesotho, it's 18. In Libya, because of the religious perspective there, uh, it's totally illegal. In the Sudan, <laughs> I visit Sudan and uh, it's illegal because of the religion, but you still see some people walking out of the hotel drunk. You don't know whether they're drinking their rooms and so on. So, so wherever you go, People want to get alcohol. Morocco, there's no clarity on the drinking age, but you can purchase from 16 and so on. Let's go to the next slide. Um, Rwanda, you can purchase at 18. There's no statement of uh, the drinking age. But all these countries, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Tunisia, and so on, uh, have been hovering around 18. And by they are realizing that, uh, you know, uh, 18, it's not enough. Many of them are supporting the idea of going to 21. Uh, the next slide, it's the same one. Um, you take uh, Chile, Colombia, and Costa Rica. Again, the patient's age is, eight, is 18, but if you visit those countries, you find the kids younger than 18 who are drinking heavily and uh, who are having serious problems. Um, finally, in Asia, there's great variation also. Um, it depends on which part of Asia you are in, but those countries where religion is strong, for instance, Afghanistan, Brunel, Bangladesh, Iran, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen, it's illegal to purchase alcohol. But you do find the rehab centers that have people with a problem of uh, heavy alcohol use or abuse of other drugs. So, so this is a problem worldwide. And I'll move out, Europe has, has, has the same problem. And um, Oceania, Oceania also has the same problem, but I'm coming to now what we as South Africans can do. Is it possible for us to channel our thinking and our practice to make sure that uh, we move the legal, the minimum legal drinking age of, or use of alcohol to 21? Is 18 not enough? If it's 18, how can we, monitor the situation such that uh, teenagers don't uh, over drink, they don't continue to binge drink. If you want to compare with countries like the USA, that is a non-starter because there are many young kids below 18 also who drink a lot in the USA. How can we coordinate available resources in this, in this country? Um, are these uh, important ministries communicating with each other? We have the Central Drug Authority of South Africa, which is looking at the various problems, uh, alcohol and drug abuse. They try to implement educational programs, but uh, are those problems programs sustained? You know, is monitoring consistent? Is legislation rigorously applied? We have to look at whether establishing partnerships involving civil society and the private sector would, would not help. We may have to increase to, uh, age 21 in the long term. However, what would be the problems? I know that industry will be very, very unhappy because age 21 would mean there are many years when uh, they cannot sell to people. But of course, uh, there are many young adults between ages 18 and 21, 16 to 18, who will be buying alcohol and drinking. So really, we are looking at this issue because uh, this month is the Mental Health Month, the 10th of October was the World um, Mental Health Day. And the emphasis of uh, this year's theme was uh, prioritization of mental health in all areas of life. And we are focusing 
for this webinar on the issue of drinking and whether as South Africans there's something we can do in order to assist people who are drinking or to assist government in terms of uh, implementing the regulations or enforcing the regulations. I'd like to thank you for listening and I'd like to invite a robust discussion uh, from you as uh, participants in this webinar, because I think it's your contribution that will help government to make sure that things go well. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank, thanks very much, Professor Rotan Mane, for this uh, limited discussion on, on the age drinking. And I think you've, you've made an argument that there is a need for engagement uh, both at home and also in government and also in the in, in the in the industry, uh, those who are uh, advertising and selling alcohol, uh, that we need to have some solutions uh, towards this problem. And I think what you've also indicated, the annual meeting uh, tablet, that's it's, it's amazing uh, that you know I don't think that information uh, has come out here. That was such an invitation for young children to go and have fun and and using alcohol as a form of entertainment that led to this tragedy that uh, we've noted in that part of the Eastern Cape. Um, the first question uh, uh, or comment also, uh, Gabriel Tubisi uh, says that uh, it's obvious that the underlying causes of underage drinking are multifactorial. Uh, certain arbitrary age restrictions and regulations will, will not help. And the marketing and sale of alcohol is unregulated and left to individual discretion. This is linked to the next question that someone is saying um, uh, that uh, I'll say I think it's Gabriel still that you should let education and responsible drinking begin at home. Parents have the greatest responsibility. You mentioned uh, I, I might just mention that uh, social social, mention social, that social, social drinking. Yeah. Doctor Tubisi didn't drink at medical school. <laughs> and, uh, I hope he hasn't started when, when he started working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, comments about that. But I think this is regulation and also parental supervision or parental guidance and the effects of, uh, I mean, you mentioned social thinking that, you know, most parents at every occasion, you know, parents do have a glass or two of wine at home and children learn from that moment. So the question Dr. Biller to ask from participants is what do they think we should do? Because this bill is going to be in parliament and then it will go to communities for comments and so on. What do they recommend and what are the reasons for those recommendations? Okay. Uh, Ashraf Lambert, your hand was up. Ashraf Lambert, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, it looks like this. But then there's, yeah, but there's also a Dr. Mbambisa says, the, the family needs to be empowered as well. So how, how, how do we empower families uh, so that they are able to guide their children? And I'm, I suppose you know, he's talking about even families like you and I, with yes. children, how do we manage, how do we encourage, how do we guide our children? Yeah. I couldn't get a picture. Okay, that's Ashraf. Go ahead. It's just too much. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Prof. Sorry. Yeah, you know, um, in one of the slides, I pointed out that uh, teenagers sometimes drink because uh, there are no parental boundaries. And that lack of parental boundaries means a number of things. Where parents feel, oh, this child is big enough he'll understand or she'll understand. And you stop uh, intervening as a parent to guide and so on. There are social institutions like the churches who are playing a very important role. And I find that there are many families who go to church, who do a lot of social things with their children, uh, going out, traveling together and so on. They don't have a serious problem. But sometimes if you feel uh, you are no longer wanted as a parent, this child is big enough, uh, that, that breakdown of um, parental boundaries, it's problematic. So, so we, we have to really rely on uh, 
the old traditions where kids are set down, we talk to them, you're not afraid to talk to them as a parent. And of course, um, the schools have to come in. Now, parents must never assume the problem is that of a child. Once there's a problem of heavy drinking, it's not that child's problem, it's a systemic family problem. So there must be part of the management of the total problem. And it works better that way so that the particular or index child who is over drinking or over using alcohol should not be isolated as the only one who has a problem. Uh, because it could be dynamics within that family that create that difficulty. High expectations from the family, for instance. Um, this child must achieve <clears throat> this and that. And then you, you noticed in, in one of those, in, in that slide, there's also an issue of rebellion, rebelliousness, a defiance. When, when kids, uh, young kids believe that their parents are imposing certain uh, wishes, rules on them, maybe that's not what they want. They can be rebellious, they can be very defiant. So you have to take a step back as a parent and say, is there something that I'm doing wrong here? Have I pushed too hard? Or do we need help? Can you go elsewhere for advice? And that's a, another important issue. Seeking advice is very helpful. Yeah, so, so there's also a, a Dr. Torayan uh, says that uh, during the time of elections, the government gives a lot of liquor to, uh, of liquor licenses. And for votes, that's what I mean, that's an indication. And second, that uh, most taverns are owned by the SAPs. And how, how can the police police themselves? So two issues there, that government, blaming government for buying votes by giving license uh, for, for tavern owners, and the taverns, and then also the police are also culprits. Yeah, you know, let, 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 let's keep hearing what other people are saying. I think uh, Pierre Jubé wanted to say something, followed by Dr. Mbambisa. Dr. Pierre Jubé. Pierre Jubé, I didn't, yeah. Uh, please, uh, colleagues, you can just uh, uh, unmute, uh, unmute yourself if you want to say something. It looks like PA is not. Anyway, uh, just before to they come in, them. there there are issues with uh, these licenses. Uh, for instance, if there's a regulation that says a tavern must be so many meters away from a school or from a church and so on, why why is no intervention? Why is there no intervention by uh, the policing uh, poli the policing system to 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 close it if it's close to a school? or close to a church and so on so on. Now there's something lacking in our monitoring as government. And, and this question of uh, these taverns being owned by police and so on, and people in government, by the way, not just the police, uh, it is problematic, you know. Um, how do you then begin to monitor that? I, I think it really, it, it means our government must do some introspection. You know, when, when they give these licenses, they must check who they're giving them to, you know, because as the, as, as the participant there said, the police will not be able to police themselves, you know. Uh, that is why sometimes we are not able to solve uh, the problems that have happened uh, in these taverns. We don't know really what the dynamics of what happened at the, the Enyobene Tavern in the Eastern Cape were. We still don't know. We hope one day we'll know. Okay. I wanted to go back, but we'll, we'll come back to the age, let's say. You know, you referred to the, 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 the surveys that indicate that the, the problem of alcohol consumption, alcoholism is, uh, if you compare provinces, you find that the Northern Cape and the Western Cape, they are the highest. Um, there, there is also a survey that was done on tobacco use. Yes. Yeah, there's a survey, but it, it, it has the same uh, results that Northern Cape in terms of tobacco use is number one, followed by the Western Cape in the country. So there seems to be some correlation between the two. Uh, there is a serious problem, Dr. Bila. You know, uh, as a team from Social Development and Department of Health, we visited Uppington, for instance, in the Northern Cape. That's a town I wanted to mention. Early in the morning, nine o'clock, people didn't know what to do. They didn't have jobs. There were no recreational facilities. They were hungry. But alcohol was available and not properly distilled alcohol. Home brews that 
had all other concoctions. And, and then that applies also to certain parts of the Western Cape where, you know, people are working in these farm, wine farms and they were paid with alcohol. So, so those are regional, you know, specificities that uh, can be taken care of. The farmers should act responsibly, but I think government must also provide certain facilities. Schools, you go to Uppington, those kids must go to school. Uh, the parents must have think, places to go to. Uh, they, have to they need jobs. Uh, it was a sad story, you know, uh, being in Uppington at nine in the morning and uh, looking around, you know, we're visiting mm -hmm. a particular treatment facility. But in the streets, you were seeing people walking around who were malnourished, but who were, were told they were drinking heavily, you know, so that is a problem. So government intervention is, is important. Okay. That was fine. Um, but it's interesting that you, you mentioned that uh, with regulation and also religious uh, in, uh, support or religious uh, convictions, places like Sudan and also perhaps I'm sure you mentioned uh, Libya, Libya, yeah, Egypt. They, 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 yeah, because these are highly, the high, you know, religion is it's, it's, it's at, the, at the core of the yes. behavior of the people there. And they restrict alcohol consumption and lower the age, I mean, the, the age limit or, or the, the, the control. But still there's a problem. So it looks like this problem of alcoholism or alcohol consumption, it's, 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 it's a, it permeates all levels of society. Yeah, I think particularly because uh, we move all over the world, Dr. Bela. You yeah. find the kids, you may be living in Sudan, but you go and get your education in the UK or in the USA. You learn some habits from there, and then uh, you struggle to hide them when you come back home. Uh, you know, there, there are complications. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think Dr. Mabisa comes back and says, values, communication, boundaries are important at home, just as, as curfew rules. 13-year-olds yes. should, should be home before sunset. Uh, but uh, yeah, possible to, to enforce that in our you know, you know the, setting. The Kabila, what, what Dr. Mbamisa is saying there is so true because one of the parents of these kids who died at that tavern said, oh, our child used to come back at one in the morning. We're happy to open the door. We're happy that the child is safe and well. But question is, why allow your child who's still going to come back home at one in yes. the morning, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, uh, are there no rules to say, look, yeah, you can go and have fun, but uh, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, you must be at home, you know? Uh, many of us were exposed to that kind of uh, um, upbringing. Where I are told, hey, you do whatever you do, but this time you must be home. You must yeah. have done your homework and uh, you must come and help you the cooking. You must come and do this and that and that, you know? But in this case, it was like, these kids could be out there the whole night. Yeah, no, that, that's that's shocking. Yeah, because I think when, when one read that uh, report, it, it was you know say that where are the values, where 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 have we lost it, you know? Yeah. But but is there also an issue of social class? Is are they do can we ascribe that to perhaps um, social class in terms of uh, restrictions and values that we have for it to cut across a different uh, social strata? Socialization is a problem. Uh, I mean, some people think you, you are backward if you don't have a glass of wine with a meal or so on. But I think uh, you can control yourself. If you don't drink, you don't drink. You don't have to do. You don't have to do what other people are doing, because they may know how to control themselves, but you may not be able to control ourselves. Secondly, you know, um, we don't have the same underlying problems. We don't have the same degree of anxiety, same degree of tension or depression and so, so on, or marital difficulties. So it may be that in your drinking, you may find solace in drinking because uh, it makes you forget some of those issues that you have to deal with. So sometimes you really have to take think first about yourself, take care of yourself rather than please the friends and you know want to belong to the group. So that is part of socialization. Yeah, I think the school uh, says that, uh, I mean, just emphasizing that there's increased alcohol consumption by women 
as drinks are advertised as refreshing and sexy, poorer communities getting more poorer uh, because of that, and, and it's, it's a pandemic. It's a serious that. problem, Dr. Bila, because when they advertise a whiskey with a beautiful woman there, when you go and buy that whiskey, you don't get the beautiful woman, you know, but you can end up being drunk alone <laughs> without a beautiful woman. I, I think these uh, media things, adverts really distort life. They give youngsters a false impression, you know, it might be saying, if you drink enough whiskey or you drink this kind of beer, your access to women or uh, your access to educational success will be easier. It's not true because we do know that alcohol reduces your responses, motor responses, it dulls your you know, ability to, uh, your inhibitions, it reduces your inhibitions, you know? Mm. You know, you become so, so loose, you don't know what you're doing basically if you drink too much. Yeah. But um, some of us, you know, you 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 you, you go in. I mean, in, in olden days, you know, where there were fewer taverns, and then you find that uh, one home in the community, you find, uh, you know, people coming in to to a small small scale tavern, so to speak, uh, that you, you find parents having a group of friends or parents coming in on a regular basis. We have a glass you know, of nip of brandy or gin, uh, but but people still survive. You know, we 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 come out of that situation, and yeah, but you know, alcoholics. They were not having ten bottles, ten liters of gin there, no? and they didn't. <laughs> drink they, they would have a bottle under the seat, and one old man would be, you know, giving thoughts, uh, you know, around. Uh, so they know that they cannot go beyond that, you know. And yeah. when, it, when the bottle is finished, it's finished. They don't continue drinking and drinking and drinking. So there was some so sense of order, you know? Yeah. And it's still there. If you go to some of the areas, you know, it's still there. But uh, in some places, the boundaries don't exist and people overdo it. Yeah. So you, you said today, there, there needs, then, when, um, then how, how can people get involved in terms of... Uh, uh, giving uh, that, you know, no comments on, on the government regulations that have been that you mentioned. I think once they are yeah. posted for comment, uh, we, we can you know you you are free to write, and it's for anyone who can comment. And uh, this has not yet been placed in Parliament that about to do that, so we can give your comment. But I think you know what I wanted to hear from our team now today. It's what they would recommend. What would you say to government? You know, mm. do they agree with uh, those proposals? Limiting of advertising on radio, TV, um, moving the adverts away from uh, circles, uh, corners of roads, and so on. Um, you know, restricting hours of access to purchasing alcohol, and and the, you know the outlets where you can purchase alcohol. Do they support that? Do they think that will that will work? Yeah, I think those are some of the the, 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 the measures that we should be considering. You mentioned the mm -hmm. fact that during the the lockdown, you know, also there are reports that indicate that clearly, uh, if you compare the admissions at emergency departments during the lockdown, and once the restrictions were, were lifted, there was a different in terms of uh, trauma cases. Yes. And that most of the trauma cases were alcohol related. So there's clear evidence that uh, limiting the, the consumption of alcohol in our society does have some health benefits or even social benefits. Yes. So these are, you know, well, one, one could say, should you go back to those draconian measures? Uh, I mean, that we saw uh, during the lockdown. Uh, it's very high where people are drinking a lot, smoking a lot, you know. Uh, if you go to any medical ward, uh, there are people who don't overuse the substances, but the majority of those who are chronic patients who go in and out of the hospital, there's a tendency to have that link to overuse of alcohol and overuse of tobacco products. Yes. Okay, it doesn't look like we've got more comments coming through. Uh, I know there are some colleagues who are in the field who see patients who are, who are locked in, and I was hoping that they can also comment. 
Uh, but I'm sure we, it was just a matter of uh, getting some more information and but sharing the final information. Thing from my side, Dr. Bila, is that we should encourage ourselves, our colleagues, and our neighbors not to shy away from getting help. You know, when you keep this thing to yourself as a family, when it explodes, it explodes very badly. Yes. There are many places where we can see, can get help now. It can be from your priest, from counseling facilities, and uh, you can go to rehab centers and so on. Be brave to do so. Don't say, I, you know, I'm, I'm this type of person. I'm a teacher, I'm a doctor. I don't think this can, I don't want to be seen to be going to those places. Those places are for all of us. They're not just for certain people. If this is not a problem of just poverty. Yes, might be increased in the poor areas, you know, poor, you know, terrible concoctions being used by people, but it affects every level of society. So we should just feel brave to say, what well, we have a problem as a family. It's a systemic one. Let's go and yeah. get help. Okay. Now, thank you very much. Uh, there's also Medicina Nabernico Government Service saying, I fully support the recommendation raised. And again, in, in addition, let's uh, introduce the producing of ID cards when buying liquor. You know, uh, that, you know, and, I mean, like yes. at the moment, you can go into any, I mean, there's a supermarket, you can go in there. Uh, get a bottle of wine, you can go to a, a mm. bottle store, I suppose, uh, but nobody's going to ask you for an ID card. Uh, so this is what, one of the measures that are being proposed that we should be looking at. Yeah, no, that, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Okay, no, thanks a lot for uh, for, for this uh, discussion. I think we should have another dialogue, uh, I mean, a dialogue perhaps on this important subject and invite other colleagues and a interactive session so that at least we can uh, hear what their comments are. Uh, before I look uh, to, to the closing, there's also Dr. Lina uh, Belli says, fetal alcohol syndrome is so detrimental to children when they start schooling. Retardation and drop out of school, uh, we should stop alcohol sales. Uh, which is just re-emphasizing what we said uh, mm -hmm. earlier on. Thanks a lot for that uh, comment, uh, uh, Linda. And thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Zoli, Dr. Mani. As I said, that we will we'll have a dialogue. Uh, we'll, we'll get more speakers, perhaps from other quarters, maybe some from government regulation to say how do we uh, stem the tide in this pandemic, as it has been said that you know, or this epidemic that we are facing in our country, uh, so that we, we we stop the schedule of alcoholism and alcohol uh, consumption that leads to so many social ills in, in our society. And I do trust and hope that uh, uh, colleagues who are voting tonight will be able to give comments on the regulations that have been promulgated so that at least we, we all participate in uh, giving solutions to this problem in our country as a whole. And I just want to say on behalf of uh, Clinic Health Group uh, that we want to thank you for availing yourself as you have done in the past and in the future, uh, please do so. And we wish you well in your all your endeavors in all the other societies and committees that you are you're involved in. And thank also you to thank the colleagues who were locked in tonight and thank you for supporting us uh, week in and week uh, out as we come here and share uh, these thoughts with you from top uh, academics like uh, Professor Adamani. And also thanks to the marketing team that works with us in the background that there's a uh, Gamu was managing the slides this evening. And we hope to reconnect again once more uh, next Thursday as we close off this month of uh, Mental Health Week. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Bob.